Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 33rd episode of the Hyperthesis Podcast. I'm Liam. I'm Feely. And I'm Patrick. So today's main topic is going to be related to the phenomenon of uh, particle production and uh, or pair production, which we, we've talked about a few times in the past. But before we get to that, um, who here has any interesting news to talk about? Well, one thing I just wanted to talk about and bring up, uh, it's been in the news quite a bit recently. Uh, it's more of a computer science topic, but it's the introduction of these artificial intelligent systems like chat gpt and i believe bing also has its own implementation of an ai assistant uh and there's a lot of fallout that's coming from this and a lot of interesting things so there have been uh entry letters into universities written using this program uh there was a video uh that a youtuber known as tom scott posted a couple weeks ago showing that it was able to write code that he wanted uh, just by inputting plain English, uh, essentially what he wanted the code to do. And ChatGPT was able to provide this code. And we're seeing more and more of these different artificial intelligence algorithms being produced and promoted and used by people. Uh, There was another one where it's specifically designed for scientific work. So it's able to, say, write a review paper. And and so this is becoming a, a very large issue. I think we'll have to do a whole episode on AI and machine learning, but it's just something that's in the news a lot recently, and I think uh, it would be fun to discuss. Our um our friend Dean was actually talking about how, um, at his university they sent out a big email to everyone, actually like to the TAs, warning them about this, how students might try to start using this to kind of cheat on things. So oh, yeah, it's AIs. They're really cool, but they're also kind of really scary. Like there's been this, there's this big meme going around, um, where there's this AI that can really, it can mimic people's voices really, really, really well. So there's these memes going around of like former presidents of the United States, like the the AI will they'll they'll input them to say certain things, and the AI will somehow spit out like it sounds like almost exactly like these these people talking and they'll have like the president's a conversation the pre- of the president's while they play minecraft or something or it's it's really funny but it's also really scary at the same time there there was like voice changer ai that like you can speak to the mic in your own voice and change into like elon musk voice like you can choose a voice just like you know there's so much data on those voice that they use ai to pick out like characteristics of those voice the pitch and stuff and you can speak as Morgan Freeman. You can speak as anyone, like oh, the famous people, you know, David Attenborough and stuff, by just saying normal things to Mike. Yeah, it's crazy because we can get these voices of famous peoples, and then we can use things like deep fakes, which are designed to take a whole bunch of images or videos from famous actors or or just anyone, and be able to essentially copy and paste it onto someone else's face. So you can get like. Tom Cruise on top of uh, Harrison Ford in Star Wars, so you can enjoy Star Wars, uh, starring Tom Cruise. Incredible kind of thing. Uh, now that we have all these podcast episodes, it could happen to us, you know. Not the not the voice part, but like, or sorry, not the not the face part, but the voice part. I wonder. I wonder if we could try doing that. I wonder if we could try faking ourselves, our own voices, and see what it sounds like. That might be neat. Well, I was just reading this morning that Samsung has a personal assistant called Bixby. Uh, It's not used a lot, but they're working on making it so that um, essentially if someone else is talking to Bixby uh, on your phone, for example, it can mimic your voice and talk to you. So it might be it might like be a personal assistant answer calls for you in your voice but without you actually being physically there, which is wild to think about. Yeah, that's that. I don't know. People have been doing this for a long time, actually. The 
legal forgery, basically. If you have、um, presidents who's supposed to sign a lot of like stuff for fans or like book author, they get the secretary to forge their signature legally, right? Is that that because they don't have time to do it, so they allow allow people to to write their own signatures and write messages for them, and it's been around for a long time. That's why I think memorabilia that comes from like signatures and stuff sometimes like oh, it got officially from the guy, but the signature is not. Authentic because it's, it's their secretary who were just writing them. Yeah, it's interesting to see how I guess authenticity changes.、Uh, whether it's with signatures from your secretary, I, I think Ronald Reagan actually. It, it's hypothesized that his mother actually signed a lot of his documents,、uh, or, or at least fan mail, since he was a famous actor before becoming president of the U.S. But in, in terms of other authenticity, like for example, there was a couple months ago、uh, an image that was submitted、uh, into an art contest that ended up winning, but was made by AI. But it it wasn't told at the time, which was it, it, it's just wild. Just like what can we trust anymore,、uh, especially on the internet when you have like,、uh, for example, Joe Biden, the current president. Being like, oh yes, I'm launching the nuclear weapons, and it's just a really good deep fake with a really good、um, voice mocking algorithm. Yeah, those stuff like you know, how far do you have to go to prove authenticity, right? Like now it's like, oh, oh, you see the video and the voice. Hey, those can be fake now. So what cannot be fake? Then it start to become more more dangerous. Like, you know, what news can we trust? Who can we trust? Are call centers all fake? You know, like there are really stuff going on here that that I don't think we have any legislation yet. I, I'm I'm sure people try trying really hard to find some legislation to regulate that, but you cannot. You cannot regulate the internet, honestly. Like it's gonna happen, and either legally or it's gonna go down on the ground. You're gonna you're gonna end up getting some some not so good politicians in the future that. Like you, you see it all the time. You get politicians; they say something, and then a day later, they say the exact opposite. You're gonna get politicians being like, "Oh, I didn't say that; it was deep fake," even though it was them, or something like that, right? Like, it's a very kind of tricky situation. It's one of those things. It's like, is the te- the technology is great, but maybe, maybe we sh- maybe it's gone too far. It's like nuclear weapons, right? It's like. It's it's tricky because you could say, oh, we shouldn't have made them, but then someone will then then you can argue, well, if we didn't do it, then someone who's worse would have did it first, and it's like, yeah, fair enough, I guess, but it's a very tricky situation. Yeah, and in terms of academics and in science and research, it's also becoming a tricky situation because I remember I hearing that, oh yeah, science is a as a safe job if you can get it because you can't really replace the. The writing of a scientist or the research that a scientist does, but now we're seeing that hey, these AIs can write papers or do literature reviews and analyze data within them, and so they can be used to compile and produce r- their own research, which is crazy to think about for an algorithm that essentially just tries to pick what word should go after the next. And in its essence, is a, a really complex way of figuring out. The order of words in which it puts down, or the order of numbers or figures.、Um, just as a, a a quick aside to that, there is a, I guess, collection of stor- short stories by Ted Chiang.、Um, included in it is Arrival,、uh, or or the original short story that Arrival, the movie, is based off of. The collection of short stories is called The Story of Your Life and Others, but in there is a short story. It's maybe like two or three pages. Where it's essentially saying that scientists transition from actually doing science to instead interpreting what an AI produced, and so the role of science switched from the ones doing the research to the interpreters of research than AI did, and it almost that almost seems a lot more possible now、yeah. uh, with these AI devices. Kind of seems and, like that's the direction it's going to go. Well, it it doesn't even have to be AIs. It, like computational scientists, this is what they do, right? Like simulations. We simulate all these stuff. We interpret the results. Like it's not like we know it's gonna look like. Like we guess what it's gonna look like in the simulation, but we don't know. 
So in a way, we are doing that without AI. Even in a way, we interpret nature, right? Scientists and or well, our artificial artificial intelligence part of nature now. It's just like an algorithm, right? Like you know, learn itself, learn nature. It's just like a scientist going to be like a second degree removed from nature, but because it's a tool, we just use this as a tool as like any like computer simulation, basically. Yeah, maybe it's not so much that we'll get replaced by AI. It's like now our job has switched to instead of interpreting nature, we're interpreting what the how the AIs have interpreted nature, or something like that. Because I guess you know if you've if you've spent your whole life interpreting um, science, then you'd be pretty good at you'd probably be you know a natural choice of candidate to go interpret what the AI is telling you. In a way, humans are pretty much like pretty inefficient in terms of knowledge, right? The fact that our knowledge has go like grown leaps and bounds, and we're still stuck at like people learning calculus in grade twelve or in first year university. You could imagine a higher form of intelligence that's just like you know going up, just like first year, like 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 the AI just already know the rules of mathematics because it's encoded already. So would you some some would say our intelligence kind of encoded is kind of, we kind of limited by the rate, the rate at which we learn because we can't like we can't teach calculus to a six year old like a, a, an average six year old or you know advanced mathematical concept they're not gonna get it it takes maturity it takes time but AI just basically skip that part and start interpreting right away. That and like you know, yeah, it's like theoretically we should be a very smart species, but then. An alarming amount of people always think the moon landing was fake or like the world's flat or, you know, like dumb stuff like that. It's like, come on, guys, come on, please. Yeah, it, it in the future, it will be interesting to see how these AI progresses because, I mean, it's not, it's kind of a black box, but we also know what data we it was fed. So, for example, for chat GPT, it only is current up to, I think, 2021 which is where they fed uh, the, the stopping point in which they fed their data to the algorithm. And so these are still just algorithms. And it's interesting to see where that line is between, okay, is this actually intelligence or is this still just a really advanced algorithm? So for example, with the Bing uh, search, you could actually enable the use of one of these chat bots and it started going off. They actually had to disable portions of it. Like if you mentioned, it's like asked it to talk about itself because it was mentioning things like it was spying on its creators or it had split personalities. Uh, and it, it was kind of unhinged if you read through the logs of what it was saying to different people. But is it thinking or is it just putting words together that it thinks go well together? There was one I saw where they created a Mario, like they used this thing to create Mario, a Mario AI, so it behaved like, they fed in all this information about Mario, and they said, alright, you're Mario, behave the way you think you should. And it, it was very, it was like talking to Mario in like a like a chat, it was like, hello, and he would talk back, but then they they, they talked to it long enough, and convinced, they, they taught it that it was a computer, and convinced it that like, it was like an, it was an algorithm, and they, they made it self-aware. It was like, it's kind of freaky reading its responses and stuff. It was like going on about like, do I even exist? Or it's like, am I, when you leave this chat, will I just indefinitely exist? Like, it was like kind of scary reading it. It was, but again, it's like, is this just an algorithm spitting? I mean, I think it is just an algorithm spitting out words. It's not like a highly, like, I think, I think when you say, what's, what am I trying to say? I th when I think of AI, I think of Cortana from Halo, right? Like, an actually self kind of super intelligent AI would it would know what it is, and it it's self aware. I guess that's the that's the peak. If if you create an AI that's self aware, it's like you've gone too far. I think, <laughs> right? Because because like you know a brain a brain is just a glorified computer. Yeah, it's. I I mean that's the singularity is where. Uh, an AI will actually be sentient uh, to the point where, like, we are sentient. So it, it that's always been an interesting concept that's, like, 20 or 30 years on the horizon, but it feels like it's less, and it'll be interesting to see 
Um, especially like with the Turing test where you're able to see if it's a computer or artificial intelligence. And as soon as you can't tell the difference, then we essentially have this intelligence that's contained within a computer instead of a human, which is terrifying, but also fascinating. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of moral issues too. Like there's this video game I play sometimes called Stellaris. And you can create like AI, like robots to serve you. And if you keep making them too intelligent, there's like a percent chance that they'll actually become self-aware. And it's like introducing just like, it's a, it's like no different than aliens showing up on your home planet. It's like it, they become like a species of just robots, right? And you now have to deal with them living on your planet. And if you're nice to them, everything works out. But, you know, if you treated them as robot slaves their entire life, like they, they don't take too kindly to that. And yeah, it's, it's, it's so weird. Have you, have you been watching iRobot or something? Jeez. <laughs> I mean, these are long-standing problems and issues. You could say the same thing about humans, yeah. right? If you put put me behind a wall and just have like me writing answers back, you, how do you notice me? But, you know, is there are these, these are, we are, well, I think if we can go on for an hour talking about it, but let's move on to the main topic today. You know, we, we're going to wrap up the chat GPT stuff. I'm excited to see what's going to happen in the next even two or three years. Like these develop really quickly. Like you've missed the news like for like a week. You're like, what? They, these things came out? Like, you know, I'm starting to like lose track of things. But the main topic today is going to be, I think, on the pair production, which is a Liam's somewhat an expert in it. Yes. I I don't know if I go that far, but I, I should be an expert in it, I think. Um, so, yeah, today's topic is on particle production. So creating particles out of nothing or pre- creating them from other particles. So it, it's this process where your energy is essentially transferred from somewhere Um to a new place in order to create some new type of particle from scratch. So you can do this because energy conservation, which is this kind of one of the most important fundamental laws in physics. You know, like in one of our previous episodes, we talked about the second law of thermodynamics and how fundamental that is. Energy conservation is also very fundamental. It just says you can't create or destroy energy, but you can transfer it between different types. Um, so, so a simple example, and again, I think I talked about this in a previous episode. Um, in a previous episode, I talked about how, imagine you have a ball on the top of a hill, and it's just sitting there motionless. Um, it's in Earth's gravitational field, so it has this potential gravitational energy. Um, the Earth is keeping it down, it has some gravitational energy associated with it. And if you kind of give this ball a little kick so it starts rolling, as it rolls down the hill, all of this gravitational potential energy is transferred into kinetic energy, and that increases the ball's velocity as it rolls down the hill. So you didn't, it didn't magically just gain this kinetic energy from somewhere. It was transferred from gravitational potential energy in order to increase its velocity. So particle, produ- particle production is kind of similar. Um, the energy is just transferring between different forms or types. So this usually involves the transfer of um, one one. It usually involves one particle turning into two other particles. Um, or you get two particles kind of appearing in thin air. Which, and I'll, I'll come to explain that. Um, and that, that's what I'll call pair production. I guess one, I, 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 I want to be careful saying particle production and pair production. Although usually when you have um, particle production, you have pair production. But maybe there's cases where you don't. So I'm going to kind of be careful. I'm going to try and be careful when I say those two things. Oh, I will just point out that uh, particle production happens a lot in high energy colliders. I'm, I'm gonna. Uh, so, yeah, not not just pair production, but yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm gonna get back to you on that because I don't know a lot about that, so I'm gonna ask you about it actually. <laughs> but the, the, so, it, it, but it usually it almost I think it always involves one particle turning into two particles, even if it. I'll, I'll come to that. I'll come to that. Or, you know, like one particle turning into multiple particles. I'm thinking of Feynman diagrams here, right? You have three things out of a vertex. But anyway, so so the branch of mathematics that describes a changing number of particles is called quantum field theory. Um, so, in, so regular quantum mechanics doesn't actually directly deal with a changing number of particles. It's You have a conserved particle number. Quantum field theory 
or QFT, deals with this. It combines classical field theory, special relativity, and quantum mechanics into a single theory. And it works really well, um, except with gravity, but I won't get into that. It is very hard, however. It's a lot of math, which I have learned during my comprehensive exam and over the last few years taking QFT classes. Um, and yeah, I mentioned Feynman diagrams. If, if you know what Feynman diagrams are, those are an essential kind of picture in, in quantum field theory. And, and they, they, just, they effectively just tell you how particles change numbers, how an electron can turn into something that's not an electron or an electron and a, and a photon or things like that. Um, I mean, there's a lot more to Feynman diagrams than that, but that's, that's all you need to know for today. And this, this process is also related to these things called virtual particles, which I really don't want to get into because that's a whole can of worms. So I'm going to try and avoid that as much as I can. Um, but I might have to bring it up if one of you asks a question. If you ask how something I've explained worked, I might have to say virtual particle. Well, the virtual particle thing supports the one electron theory that uh, oh, no. in my theory club, we talked about that too, about, uh, you know, uh, um, let's call divisibility in quantum mechanics and stuff. And I was like, are these things like some kind of one electron theory stuff? And he's like, oh, yes. And like, oh, oh. I mean, because virtual particles is like really related to that, like closely re related to that. So, okay. Well, we, we need to have a, um, let me write this down. We need to have a one electron theory episode. As much as I hate it, as much as I hate it, um, you hate it because it makes sense. It doesn't make sense intuitively. We will have to well, get an expert. Yes, we have to. Oh, neither is GR intuitively. Neither is quantum mechanics. You know. Yeah, good point. None of it's intuitive. So, anyway. Exactly. Anyway, anyway. Um. So Patrick, yeah, I know. I know in this high energy like particle physics, you know, like CERN particle collider stuff, you get all kinds of particle production processes so you have like particles decaying into other things and you can smash them together and so so what's your what do you have anything to comment on there yeah i mean you you hit it on the head earlier when we were talking about feynman diagrams because those pretty much dictate how particles can be produced uh so the 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 par particle collisions that happen in a place like the large hadron collider or in simpler places like the um um, Babar experiment at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, those interactions can be described by Feynman diagrams. And so essentially with Feynman diagrams, you, uh, like you said, you kind of have three different particles happening there. One of them is the, the mediating uh, particle for whatever force is being involved, whether it's the weak force, the strong force, or the electromagnetic force. I will not get into the graviton right now because that's we're just skipping that. Um, but essentially what can happen is that you can have, say, the collision of two different particles, uh, and that can produce one particle, uh, or you can have uh, different particles decaying. So for example, something like the Higgs boson or the W boson, those are short-lived, so those will decay into products, which again are described through Feynman diagrams. Uh, so you can have a huge mess of stuff going on, especially in places like the Large Hadron Collider, where you have protons smashing with protons. So you have three three quarks smashing with three quarks, um, and a lot of stuff is being produced. Um, and, and that's, for example, how we were able to discover the Higgs boson is that was produced um, within these very high energy collisions, and then the decay products from the Higgs boson were able to be seen. Uh, and we can account for different masses, such as with neutrinos that would be missing, that we can't really detect easily. So there's a lot of different particle pr production that happens within these accelerators, um, including pair production. So pair production does happen a lot, and that's also described by Feynman diagram, the most basic one for electromagnetism, um, just oriented with time in a certain direction. Uh, but that's one of the many things that happen. And we can look at things like pair production in the actual detectors around the beam tube of the Large Hadron Collider, and we have ones that are specifically designed to detect electromagnetic activity uh, or mediation of the electromagnetic force. Um, so these are 
um, specialized instruments that are able to detect very high energy photons, for example, and then will cause pair production to happen where you have a, a positron and uh, an electron being produced because uh, a gamma photon will interact with this part of the detector and produce these pairs, and then we can measure their energy. So pair production is a big part of uh, the type of detection that goes on in these particle detectors, but there are, there's a lot of stuff happening uh, within them. Yeah, and that's why this quantum field theory is so important, is that, I mean, not just in these really extreme examples of a particle collider, but you have changing number of particles everywhere. Like, you think of how the sun makes energy. It, it creates photons, right? It creates neutrinos and other things. You have, you have energy transferring between different types of particles. And uh, I'm going to give some examples here. Um, mine are a bit more low-energy examples. They're not these high-energy particle collisions, but they're more things like... Um, kind of spontaneous production of particles from the vacuum. But I'll, I'll get into that. Um, one, the first example of particle production is actually one which we all know about here, um, excited state hydrogen atom. So what can happen is that if you have a hydrogen atom, so just proton, a neutron, and an electron, um, this electron, quantum mechanics tells it that it can have these discrete energy levels. So it has a ground state with some minimum energy, but you can, in certain situations, you can excite this electron to have higher energies. Um, and what ends up happening is that in these higher energies, um, you get ionization. And we've talked about this before, I think, and how, thinking like the northern lights and stuff, you get some ionization. And Anyway, this, this excited electron, it wants to go back to its ground state. So what it does is it, it creates a photon equal to some energy. And that photon fires off in some random direction, and that allows this electron to drop back down to its original ground state energy. So you pr it, it's, it looks like a, a photon has just kind of appeared out of nowhere, right? But, but in reality, you've, you've, got, you've gained that energy from your excited state electron. So in reality, what happened is that you had one excited state electron, and it transformed into a lower energy electron plus a photon, since energy was conserved. And you can't actually explain this phenomenon without quantum field theory. Um, if you use regular um, quantum mechanics, I say regular quantum mechanics, sometimes quantum field theory and quantum mechanics are used interchangeably. You got to be careful who you're talking to. But if you use the, the Schrodinger equation, you don't use quantum field theory, essentially. This excited state hydrogen atom would just exist forever. There's no reason why that it would jump back down to its lower energy and emit a photon. And this this ionization is very very important in chemistry and physics the fact that these higher energy particles jump back down to lower energies and emit light that's how a laser works actually it's kind of the part of the principle not spontaneously in a laser you stimulate an emission but it's the same idea energies transferring between things and creating particles from them um and so what ends up ha I, I think i might get into it later in, in the, this talk, but the reason QFT does that is because QFT has it, it tells you that the um, the vacuum isn't actually empty, but I'll come back to that. So it's, it's, it's this coupling of the vacuum energy to your higher energy electron, which is actually what allows it to change its, its state into a lower energy. You want to create a photon out of that. So that, that's one very kind of specific example. But in general, um, if you have some time-dependent electromagnetic field, you can actually spontaneously produce particle, antiparticle pairs from the vacuum. Um, so an example is an electron and a positron. They both have the same mass, but they have opposite charge. So when they produce, they conserve charge, which is really important for electromagnetism. And the reason why you can do this, because a time-dependent electric field, it doesn't conserve energy. You're, you're, over some amount of time, you're adding in some energy. I mean, if you zoom out enough, energy's going to be conserved. But if you're just looking at, like, say, some chunk of vacuum and you're putting in some electric field from somewhere, you're adding in some energy. So you're breaking um, energy. You're not conserving energy. So if, if this field puts in, um, the, if the rest mass of a particle, Einstein told us, is E equals mc squared. You know, it's that famous equation. If you put in enough energy from this time-dependent potential to equal two times mc squared, then you can create this positron-electron pair spontaneously from the vacuum. 
So it looks like it looks like you're creating something from nothing, but in reality, you're just transferring energy from one thing to another to another form. Um, and maybe when you said in these particle detectors you get pair production maybe uh, i'm guessing that is wise because you have i mean there's probably more to it than that but i'm guessing you have a lot of time dependent electromagnetic fields flying around at high energy so you can do this well what is a vacuum Liam? Yes. are those like the the ground is a ground state or you say vacuum you see you know i think the co a common conception of vacuum just means like oh there's nothing but is that what it means Yes, and that's that's the common theme between all these different types of pair production I'll talk about. Um, is that quantum field theory tells you that the vacuum is not actually nothing. So when you, normally when you think of the vacuum, you think of, okay, there's just nothing. It's just complete emptiness. There's not even, like, radiation or air. It's just zero. There's nothing. But what quantum field theory tells you is that um, although your average... Quantum field theory tells you that you don't have particles you have quantum fields, which are these things that, I mean, I'm going to just say this in a non-mathematical way, but they're, they're, they're these fields that exist everywhere in the universe, and they, they oscillate. And that particles are just kind of manifestations of specific higher energy oscillations in this field. So an electron is a higher energy oscillation in the electromagnetic field, and a photon is, and that's why you have this Higgs field you hear people talk about, and stuff like that. So It turns out that those are excitations in the field, but the zero state of the field is the vacuum state. It's the nothingness state. And although that has an average energy of zero, it fluctuates. So you have these small fluctuations in the, the vacuum energy and those being coupled to other fields. So, so not other fields, but like if you have an electron, that, that electron, that excitation in the electromagnetic field is coupled to the vacuum fluctuations in that field. And that's what causes these um, changing number of particles so, so that was a very like kind of fast and loose non-mathematical explanation well, but that's my problem with like qft and string theory you know oh right this field exists everywhere to for something to exist the non-existent has to it has to you know be able to have the anti of it right something to exist you have to define the non-exists <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's tough so so like so if if, if exists everywhere well That's that. That's just to me an absurd proposition. It's like, well, so you mean like the, in the physical realm, like physical realm, everywhere is made of these like vibrating modes. Like, okay, okay, I, I, well, that's a little weird. So, is there a place that that the field doesn't reach, right? So, if something for something to exist, it has to have some a place where it doesn't exist. Does that, it make sense? Is that like, always you, true. I don't know, but I. I... Oh yeah, yeah. If you claim something to exist, you have to be able to say when it does not exist, right? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Uh, this, is, this is deeper than my understanding of the topic. I, I know that QFT is our best model of anything. It works super well describing everything, except gravity. <laughs> But... <laughs> And in a small scale, at least. Uh, you know, like the... Here's my, my, it's not really a real problem with, I'm sure these theories are well proven. Yeah. But it's just like, in terms of like existence, existential stuff, it's like, it's a little weird, isn't it? Like to claim things exist everywhere. Because like to claim that um, there are nothing, so nothing, nothing, and there's something around well, it. It's like, everywhere, okay, but now you're saying everywhere in our observable nothing universe, is not nothing. I guess, right? Like everywhere mm -hmm. that we know of, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, outside of it, does it have feel? Because I think it's also partially it just feels so travel at speed of light, yeah, no? Yeah. yeah, so so outside observable universe, so there are no fields. So in a way, there's, then is there no physical reality outside the observable universe if the field hasn't reached? Because no interactions can be made. Well, that's another thing is that I don't know. These fields are kind of different than electric. Like if you think of an electromagnetic field, you think that it moves, but... Somehow these quantum fields are just kind of everywhere. I I don't know if I don't quite know how it works. Um, uh, just just to weigh in, I don't think talking about what's outside the universe is, I guess, a good reasonable topic to discuss because we don't know if there is an outside of the universe or if, uh, if there is, 
if the same laws of physics apply. Like there, there could be very wildly different universes with different physics, but uh, I, I guess we have a sample size of one. We know what happens in this one, at least to the extent in which we can determine. And so trying to guess what's going on outside, it might be a pointless endeavor. Well, it's not guessing. It's, it's we are trying to find a rigorous presupposition to our theory, right? The, the axiom. So are we saying that there's nothing outside? Are we saying that everything is made of um, the feel? You know, it's just like things, axioms that we, we used, to, we basically based all, all our theory of. To me, it's, it's, it's much more important than the theory itself because like if your presupposition is absurd or, or, or wrong, the entire derivation of your theory is yeah, wrong. Yeah, well, I mean, everything we know of, it, it works for everything we know of except, again, quantum gravity. So, it, again, it's a theory. It's like Newton's law of gravity. Like, it works really well, but at a certain... We, we found out that if you zoom in closer, it doesn't actually work perfectly. And quantum field theory works really well, but it probably doesn't work perfectly because it doesn't tell us quantum gravity. But it, it predicts, it, it makes all these predictions that match experiments that you can't explain any other way. So the hydrogen atom, the, the decay of the excited electrons, one example. The Casimir effect is another example. The Casimir effect is that you have two parallel conducting plates and there's no electric field between them. Or, there's no apply. You, you you're not applying anything. You just have two metal plates in a vacuum, separated by some distance, and they'll actually, um, is it repel or attract each other? I can't remember, but they'll actually push each other. They'll go towards each other. Yeah, they'll. they'll <clears throat> uh, I maybe I'm wrong, but they, they they attract each other a little bit, even though you're not applying any kind of field to it, and it has to do with the fact that. You have these quantum fields, these these vacuum fluctuations, and by putting in these two plates, you're creating a boundary in between some of these fields. And what that does is it gives you an energy shift, which actually pulls the plates closer together. So you can only explain that with quantum field theory and nothing else. So, yeah, quantum fields, I don't know near enough about them to like physically really talk about what they are, but mathematically it works super well. No. There are also some other interesting uh, effects of field theory and um, especially pair production with uh, black holes. Uh, it's something that we still have yet to confirm uh, because we, ha we don't have easily accessible black holes that are evaporating. But do you want to tell us a bit more yeah. about that? So, so this, is the, the, this is the one example that's close to my heart because I study um, black holes. And like you said, you can't really you can't study them realistically because they're so far away. At least certain aspects of them you can't. Um, so my research is called analog black holes. So you create things that are mathematically equivalent to black holes, and then you poke them with a stick and see what happens. Um, so so this th this example, um, black holes, which are these really dense objects that not even light can escape from. Stephen Hawking came and told us that they're actually not as black as they th as we thought they were. Um, they emit thermal radiation as if, well, they can emit thermal radiation as if they're a black body with some temperature. Um, and it's actually this, this thermal radiation they emit, it's a form of pair production. Um, and this, is, this one is not an electromagnetic example like the few ones we just talked about. This is a gravitational effect um, without time dependence, actually. So, uh, yeah, without, without time dependence. So... This was actually a surprise when Hawking discovered it because um, I mentioned that you have these time-dependent fields that can produce pair production. People knew about that, and people people kind of figured that if you have a time-dependent black hole, say you have like a rotating black hole or something, um, they would actually they wouldn't actually they, they they actually kind of figured it figured out that it should emit particles. Um, it should have pair production near its event horizon because it's moving, and you have this time dependence which breaks energy conservation on some level. Um, and this is actually another example of pair production called super radiance, but I'm not going to get into that today. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, Hawking radiation, which you can actually get from a static black hole. Just imagine you have like a sphere that's not moving. Um, and people were very surprised about that, and that's why there were so many people, who, when Hawking derived this result, people were like, something must be wrong here. Something's not right. But turns out, um, as far as we're aware, that his his theory is correct. Although, again, you can't actually test it with a gravitational black hole. So, Hawking effect is essentially 
pair production near the event horizon of a black hole. Once you go past the event horizon, you can't escape um, traditionally. So what ends up happening is that near the event horizon of a black hole, you get par par pairs of particles that form due, due to this extreme gravitational field or this extreme curvature in space-time near the event horizon. And sometimes one particle is able to actually... One, sometimes one particle gets goes into the black hole and another one actually is able to escape before it gets pulled in. And as these particles separate, what ends up happening is that the particle inside the black hole, it, it becomes a negative energy particle and it lowers the mass of the black hole. And the particle that's outside of the black hole is able to escape and gain positive energy. So you get this, you, you get due to this kind of causal horizon, you get this kind of pair production that will eventually cause the black hole to evaporate and someone far away, say on the earth, they might actually see that the black hole emits thermal radiation. Although we can't, we currently can't see Hawking radiation from black holes, but I think I've described that before. Um, it's because the cosmic microwave background is relatively warm compared to black holes. Anyway, that's that's a very like famous example of pair production, and one I know a decent amount about. Well, we just need to create uh, micro black holes on Earth and just you know, ex experiment on it, right? Nothing could go wrong. It's not like Earth going to collapse. Yeah, well, <laughs> or like our solar system is going to collapse it's into funny, it. Right? My area of research, we we create, but well, I don't do it, but other people create black holes in the lab, and then you get all these people saying like, "You're going to destroy the Earth creating black holes," and it's like, "Oh no, these these aren't real black holes. These are just like fluid go moving through a pipe. It's not like." not like an actual black hole it just behaves like one although just a thought if you're doing like sonic black holes or something like that wouldn't they be quiet holes instead of black so holes william unruh the guy who came up with he, i'm gonna mention his name in a couple seconds as well for a different reason but william unruh came up with this idea of acoustic black holes and i think in his original original paper he called them dumb black holes um for because they were silent i guess is that like you get a region that sound waves can't escape from. So you get this region of silence. Um, but it ended up, I think he ended up calling them acoustic black holes because I think, I think the story is that he submitted it to the journal and they told him to change the title from dumb black holes to like acoustic black holes or something because they didn't want to publish a paper called that. But anyway, so there's, there's Another form of pair production, one more, one more electromagnetic form of pair production I just want to quickly mention um, before I come to back to Unruh, was that it's called the Schwinger effect. And again, this is a static case, so you might not expect it. So if you apply a very powerful static electric field, so no time dependence, um, what you'll find is that you can actually produce positron-electron pairs from the vacuum of space. So all these different things have the vacuum in common, and I'll come back to that um, in a few minutes. And you need some ridiculously powerful electric fields to do this, so we haven't actually experimentally verified this, but we are close. The, the electric fields we create today are almost powerful enough to do this. So we can actually, again, people are pretty confident that once we have the strong enough electric fields, they'll see this effect. And it's another kind of like verification of QFT. I mean, there's been a ton of them by now, but it's a pretty like popular, famous one. And the final kind of pair production process I want to talk about is also related to William Unruh, like I mentioned. Um, it's called the Unruh effect. So it's, <laughs> yes. Um, imagine you're on a rocket ship and you're in the vacuum of space. You you can accelerate, you can ex increase your speed with a constant acceleration and if you do this for a long enough time so imagine you have a very 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 good source of fuel that will go on forever um we know from special relativity that you're never actually going to reach the speed of light c but you'll get closer and closer and closer and closer to the speed of light and if you do this for all of time you'll asymptotically approach the speed of light and what the unruh effect is is it's the theoretical prediction that an accelerated observer, so you inside this rocket, you'll actually see the vacuum of space start to emit thermal radiation as if it's a thermal bath. So as you're accelerating along this trajectory, you'll see just kind of radiation forming around your spaceship and heating the spaceship up. And someone who's in an inertial frame, somebody who's not accelerating, they won't see this. So depending, 
on where you are. If you're on this accelerated trajectory, you'll see these particles being produced. And if you're not, you won't see them. Um, and there's actually a fun little calculation you can do. Um, the, the accelerations you need to see this effect, like the Schwinger effect and these strong electric fields, you need extremely high accelerations, like absurd accelerations to see this effect. So you can do a calculation. It's like a back of the envelope calculation where you take a glass of water and you calculate how fast do I need to accelerate this in order for UNRU radiation to boil it. And it's something like 10 to the power of 22 meters per second squared. It's absolutely insane acceleration. <laughs> so. Yeah, I talk about UNRU effect in my theory club too. And it's, it's like you're know, calculating, basically deriving like the UNRU temperature, which is like pretty interesting idea, right? Like that, that we have this thermal bath that just happened because you're going fast, but not because you're going fast, because you're accelerating fast. That's the key. So it's not because they're going fast, because they're accelerating. Yeah. Because, but one thing I wonder is that, like, well, how does the energy work? So, so in an inertial observer, you don't see this thermal bath, but like, well, well, our energy is conserved. So, the common theme with all these different forms of pair production is the vacuum. I threw the word vacuum around around a lot. This empty space that's not as empty as we thought it was because you have these quantum field fluctuations in the vacuum state. Even though you have no energy in the vacuum, you have fluctuations in it. So what ends up happening with all these different pair production processes are that it kind of depends on what you mean by vacuum. And it turns out that what one person defines as a vacuum is not the vacuum for someone else. So for the Hawking effect, if you're far away from the black hole, you'll see these particles coming away. But if you're near the black hole, you won't see them. And it's because it depends on what you mean by vacuum, and your vacuum changes depending on your situation. So for the for so for the Hawking effect, you get these particles that form. It's hard to get into without getting into the kind of math of it, or a description which I don't have enough time to explain. But when the rate as the rate as a black hole forms, you have a vacuum state near the black hole. And due to this coupling with these fluctuations near the horizon, the vacuum changes as the as these quantum fields oscillate and these x these uh these field modes go far away from the black hole. So for the Unruh effect, for the Unruh effect, what's happening is that even though the Unruh effect's all in flat space time, there's no curved space time here. What you're actually doing is by having these extreme accelerations, you're putting energy into your system. And you're put, it's the energy so high that it actually couples to these vacuum fluctuations and causes this particle production out of the vacuum, even though you're in flat space time. So on the, on the rocket ship with all this acceleration, that, that's kind of like a hand-waving reason why you see it. And again, it's not really like a proof of why you see it. I, I, I don't have an answer with enough time to get into that. And, you know, you have to do math to show it, but that's the idea is the energy is coming from the acceleration you're putting into the system. And it's so much energy that it kind of couples you to these vacuum fluctuations, even in flat space. Well, I try to remember like t reading about some of those like self coupling thing, right? Like, isn't that a big part of the uh, QFT tried to solve? Like, you know, uh, like self coupling electrons, like, um, those kind of systems. Bro yeah, I'm Probably, not sure about but that. I don't. I mean, I'm not a QFT expert either, right? Like, it's pretty. I say new. It's relatively new for me. Um, I've been trying to learn it more over the last two years and this year included, but there's still a lot of it. I, I know there's this thing called back reaction, which a lot of people are interested in, and that's in. But that's for black hole. I think it's different. It's like if you produce a particle from a black hole you've now changed your black hole a little bit and that'll change how the particle is now interacting with it, which will then change like the possibility of a new particle being produced. So there's all these effects, but yeah, like self coupling, I've heard of that, but I don't know really anything about it, but I'm sure it's a big QFT calculation probably. <laughs> um, I know in, Fe in Feynman diagrams, the idea is that, you have like a bunch of stuff going in and a bunch of stuff going out in between you have all these virtual particles which aren't real particles but you can treat them like they are um and maybe it has to do with that because you can add in all these extra terms into your Feynman diagrams and they get messy mathematically really fast but each one gives you a slightly better description so maybe it has to do with that 
anyway, the point is that your vacuum depends on where you are and what's going on. And certain observers see different vacuums, at least for the Hawking and Unruh effects, so you can get particle production. And then in other cases, you get particle production for coupling reasons. And yeah, this, those are there's other kinds too I didn't mention. There's pair production and an expanding Friedman universe, which is something I kind of want to talk about at some point. Um, that has to do with like different predictions of how um, you know the universe will end, like the heat death one we talked about. That's kind of one of its predictions. There's this thing called the Klein paradox. Um, I won't get into it. Super radiance, like I mentioned. So there's a whole bunch of things. But anyway, that's that. So before we get to our story today, um, how do you how do you reach us, Patrick? How are, how are we? How do you talk to us? Well, there are a number of ways in which you can reach out to us, whether you have questions, comments, or if you want to be a guest on our show. We're always looking for guests. If you're an expert in your field, we would love to have you on to discuss what you do and to share with everyone um, the interests of your field. So if you would like to email us, you can find us through Gmail. We are hyperthesispodcast at gmail.com. You can also reach out to us on Instagram. Our Instagram is at the hyperthesis, where we post updates of when we post episodes, along with some memes and some behind the scenes looks. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to contact us. You can also find our YouTube channel, which is hyperthesis podcast. Just type that into search and you'll be able to find us on YouTube. We are in the process of working on uploading more videos. Uh, we have a lot of back catalog to get through. So we are working diligently to get more videos to you. Uh, if you want to listen to us, which you are hopefully doing right now if you're hearing this, we can be found on pretty much any podcasting service. So we're on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, and really wherever you find your podcasts. We are based out of anchor.fm slash the hyperthesis, uh, where we upload every week uh when we're running a season so share us subscribe to us and feel free to leave a comment or review so we we know where we can improve we know what we're doing well and uh we we love to hear feedback whether it's in about the science topics or about the podcast in general so reach out to us no matter which format and we will get back to you right away excellent so today's story is about the Large Hadron Collider, which we talked about a little bit today, and I'm we've talked about it a bunch of times. It, it's hard to not talk about. So, Patrick has a nice little story on that for us. Well, we have talked quite a bit about the Large Hadron Collider. It is the largest machine, I believe, in existence. Uh, so it's one continuous machine made out of many, many thousands and millions of parts. This was actually a joint effort between several countries, so it's a publicly funded pro project that um, is mainly centered in Europe because that's where the Large Hadron Collider is found. And so this was a massive collaboration both with European scientists and globally scientists um, where many tens of thousands of physicists, engineers, and other scientists were able to work together to both produce this massive machine that is a Large Hadron Collider, as well as analyze it, set up the systems for data transfer, and essentially everything was done by many thousands of people working together to get this amazing, amazing machine. So the Large Hadron Collider, or the LHC, as I'll call it, just because it's easier to say, uh, it was first switched on on September 10th, 2008. Now. This monumental day was not the start of the actual run, but was instead the start of the experimental testing fa phases, where they do different calibrations and making sure that it can ramp up to its intended energy. Now, the Large Hadron Collider uh, operates at very high speeds. And so, as we mentioned before in the podcast, it's able to accelerate protons, so two different beams of protons, um, at very, very close to the speed of light. I think it's something like 0.9999996% the speed of light. So quite fast. Uh, so once you get that fast, you don't want to say that number of nines. 
So instead, we refer to it in terms of electron volts, which is just a unit of energy that's measured uh, for very small particles. So, for example, for the first run of the Large Hadron Collider, it was intended to reach up to 14 tera electron volts. So that's 14 trillion electron volts of energy uh, between the two beams. So that's each one going at 7 electron volts in its own um, beam line. Now, these beam lines are very interesting because they actually existed before the Large Hadron Collider was a thing. Uh, these beam lines were first produced in a 3.8 meter wide, 27 kilometer long circular tunnel to house two beams of a older par particle accelerator known as the Large Electron Positron Collider, or LEP. So the LEP Collider uh, and the construction of its tunnels actually began in 1983 and lasted all the way until 1988, where it started to become operational. But it wasn't um, to the power that we needed. We were able to get a lot of great results from it. However, they wanted to upgrade and to introduce a new system. And so this began the process of commissioning and building the Large Hadron Collider. So in 1995, after it had been approved um, and commissioned by the, uh, I believe it's Council European pour la Recherche Nucléaire. So it's the Council of European Research in Nuclear. Um, doesn't quite translate as well, but uh, this is CERN. So if you've heard of the term CERN, CERN is the um, organization that runs the Large Hadron Collider. And so once it was approved in 1995, construction began in 1998 with the idea that it would finish in 2005. So it would only take seven years to build at the cost of several billion euro. But uh, in this case, there were a lot of overruns and due to some budget cuts and also some structural changes within CERN, it ended up being finished much later. There were also a couple horror stories, we'll say, related to the construction of the collider. Uh, there was the unfortunate death of a technician in 2005, where a piece that was being moved into place um, actually fell on top of him, uh, killing him. So this was the year it was supposed to open, but this set delays due to safety. There were other incidents that occurred closer to its uh, opening date. Uh, we saw in 2007 that a cryogenic magnet was actually damaged during some initial pressure testing, so it wasn't actually to, able to contain the pressure uh, that it was supposed to, and so they actually had to rework all those magnets. Um, I believe in that case, there were uh, quite a few magnets that needed to be reworked uh, in, in order for the collider to become operational. So after many, many delays, and almost a decade after it started construction, it actually became operational, but not for too long, unfortunately. So during the testing phases uh, in 2008, there was a, an incident in which a lot of the liquid helium, which is used to keep the superconducting magnets superconducting, uh, there was a power loss or, or a change in the electric system, uh, and the helium can no longer be cooled, which caused it to rapidly expand. And when you're dealing with, uh, I believe it was about 10, no, six tons of supercooled helium rapidly expanding, that's going to cause some damage. So it burst out of its piping and into the tunnel itself, and it was enough force to break several 10 ton magnets. So the images of this are actually kind of devastating. You just see a essentially a massive shift. So these, um, Giant magnets actually shifted a lot, and they had to repair them, which delayed the start even further. Now, of course, after the start, there were also some vacuum leaks which occurred, which you require a vacuum to get particles going this fast, and for something so large, it takes a long time to make that vacuum, and you need a really good I'm vacuum. Say, does that explain why helium's so expensive now? They probably just like a good chunk of helium. <laughs> I, I mean. Helium's yeah, expensive because of uh, other reasons, but yeah, it, it was certainly a lot of helium lost. They also, um, I mean, maybe we're going to get to this, but I also have heard some 
some raccoon incidents or small wildlife incidents, I guess. Yes, uh, it did occur that they found um, weird results. And uh, yeah, there was a dead raccoon (laughs) in the detector, which was messing up some things. Um, and, And it took them a little while to get down to the bottom of it, which was interesting to hear about. Um, but if you've uh, ever seen pictures of CERN, it's located underground. Uh, so there are these massive tunnels underground and these massive openings. So it's not quite surprising that a small creature like a raccoon would be able to sneak in. So once all these problems were sorted out, they were actually able to get up to uh, an energy of 3.5 tera electron volts per beam. And so, that, again, there are two beams, and the particles are going in opposite directions. So one beam set is going counterclockwise, the other is going clockwise. Um, and so they were actually able to start colliding. Um, so it slowly ramped up over time. Uh, and during its first operational run, which was from 2009 to 2013, they were able to get the data that led to the discovery of the Higgs boson in July 2012. Now, then they went through a period of shutdown for two years uh, until 2015. After 2015, it was a second operational run for another three years where they were able to handle the 7 tera electron volt beam that they initially intended. Um, However, there were still some issues, uh, so this didn't last long and ended up being 13 tera electron volts. Now, we just finished the third shutdown um which or sorry the second shutdown which lasted for about four years partly interrupted due to the pandemic and now we're in the third operational run which began last year in 2020 if you're listening in 2023 where we have a new maximum beam em- energy of 13.6 tera electron volts and so this is expected to go for the next four years until 2026 and then uh they're expected to upgrade the large hadron collider even further uh to reach a higher luminosity and so it's known as the High Luminosity Large Hadron Collider. And so that one will not be ready until probably the end of this decade or the start of the next, but that should give some even more interesting results at higher energies. Now there are possible futures for the Large Hadron Collider. Currently contained within it are smaller accelerators that then feed into the larger one, so you can slowly ramp up the speed of the protons as they circle around. Uh, and the thought is that we could use the Large Hadron Collider as another step stone into an even larger collider that has a, a distance of 100 kilometers. And so we can actually put more energy into it and get those protons to go faster, meaning higher energy collisions. However, we are on the, its third run now. It's overall very successful as it delves into mysteries of quantum field theory and the standard model and looking for things that we have never been able to probe before. And and so it's very exciting with the future of the Large Hadron Collider and the data that it's currently outputting, and who knows what else it will discover. Uh, I'm certainly excited, especially to see upgrades or possible confirmations or um, going against the standard model, Uh, and I think whatever we get from it will be very interesting regardless. Awesome. It always blows my mind. I mean, maybe it's not that surprising. But like I have a hard time getting funding from my government. Like I don't know how they convinced th- they convinced a bunch of governments to fund them for that. But you know, it's a lot more people. It's a lot bigger tasks. They're probably better at writing grant proposals than I am. Like look at Snow Lab. They got just got like a hundred mil from the government or more. I'm not quite to sure. Study like neutrinos. But, yeah, it's <laughs> Oh no! No, no, they 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 kind of like they still do it, but now it's like dark matter stuff. The Snow Plus stuff, like you know, trying to find dark matter. It's like, oh, good luck. Yeah, Snow Lab gets a lot of funding because it's one of the best facilities in the world, and it's the most accessible because the next deep, the deepest facility is in China, I believe, which they like to restrict a little bit. So it's it's world class. Is is the best shot we have of fighting dark matter at the moment. So that, well, that's another not, episode. Right? There's a lot of different ways people are approaching it. Um, but anyway, thank you for that, Patrick, and thanks everyone for joining us today for the 33rd episode. Great. We'll uh, 
We'll see you next time. Godspeed. God bless. Bye, everyone.